So please let me introduce our first speaker. Um, I'm very um, excited to have today with us Suchet Bagodi. He comes um, from Abyss Solutions and um, will tell us about using uh, robotics for underwater infrastructure uh, inspections. So Suchet uh, has um, a PhD in field robotics and he's now working in the field of using machine learning together with robotics to uh, deal with problems that no person like physically, manually could deal with. So making really smart machines uh, to go out there and uh, solve um, uh, and, and work in really um, environments that uh, we um, can't easily access. Um, his, research, his research at the Australian Centre for Field Robotics uh, has impacted many applications. He worked on agricultural robotics, urban automation and underwater mapping, as well as space exploration. At Abyss Solutions, he leads um, the technical vision um, of this rapidly growing uh, business and uh, looks into automating conditioning assessments of underwater assets. What is that? How do you do that? Please tell us all about it. And please welcome on stage Suchet Bagodi. Thanks for that introduction, Fabian. Um, so yeah, uh, here from a startup called Abyss Solutions. Um, the team started up uh, three, four years ago by a bunch of PhD students in um, Australian Centre for Field Robotics. And there we were just um, sort of exploring the state of the art in sending robots to challenging spaces like agriculture, like uh, dry agriculture fields, uh, space robotics, deep underwater systems, and uh, there was a lot of great research coming on. So, you know, um, the CEO who started off the company was looking at how do we start to commercialize these products and how can we deliver value to the industry with the technology that we are building. And then sort of started the journey of where Abyss Solutions uh, uh, is trying to address in this field. So the areas that we're looking at is critical in infrastructure. So there's a wide range of markets uh, that have critical infrastructure, especially in the underwater domain, that uh, require keen observations as to their conditions to be able to make smarter decisions as to how to manage these infrastructures. Take an offshore rig, for example. You need to know exactly uh, where the fatigue points are in the offshore rig and how they change over time to then start to make decisions on when should intervention happen and when we should take preventative measures uh, to make sure no big disaster happens. And at the same time, you don't want to just continue doing an intervention for no reason and you want to save costs. But when dealing with these sort of infrastructures, actually sending people there to do the inspections can be quite challenging. And then even sending robots there to do the inspections can end up leading to very uh, like suboptimal quality data products where you might have a video looking at a feature in an in a asset for hours and hours but still don't know what to do about it and you don't know how that asset is changing over the years so you can't make smart decisions because good data is not good data insights are not being calculated from that data so one of the things that we observed in the market that you know uh, with the different uh, markets that we were working with in order for them to drive optimal asset management, they are really depending on high quality data. You know, how do they capture, how, do they, how, do they, how can they get really good quality imagery, really good quality acoustics in the underwater case? Uh, how can they filter through terabytes and terabytes of data that they normally get? Or, or if they send divers down, how can they make the best out of the very sparse sampling that they do to collect that data? and still make decisions on you know, the best, next best optimum time to fix this asset is next year, and the risk factor is uh, so much that I'm comfortable with that. So this is sort of where we step in, uh, and um, we're sort of looking at the, both the sort of data capture aspects of infrastructure assessment and the analytics component of infrastructure assessment, leading to a 
data product that can allow our customers to really make the most, make the best decisions from that information. So typically, um, like you know, I've been to a few of these meetups, and a lot of focus is on the analytics. But I would like to talk about two things today. One is the actual data capture, and the second is the analytics. Because the company sort of started off also thinking that, hey, maybe we can just do analytics, and other people are going to give us their data, and we will extract meaningful information from it. And what soon happened is people gave us a lot of rubbish data and told us to apply AI to it to find the results. And we found it a lot easier, like we spent months and months trying to work with poor quality video data, and it's easier to just do the investment on the hardware development to go out there and capture data ourselves in many of the markets. So here's a little example that I like to play that sort of shows this end-to-end -end process. Um, hopefully that plays, yes. On, a, on an asset uh, in the shipping industry, on a ship propeller. So here's one of the small robots that we have that is equipped with an imaging system that we built in order to capture high quality information of a ship propeller. The client here came up to us and said, look, I've got this new ship propeller and it is experiencing some accelerated corrosion. And can you, and I'm not sure exactly how that is happening or what the extent of that is. So we went out there and collected the data systematically underwater. The thing with underwater imaging is that you can't see very far. So when you look at individual images, you have no idea what's happening at a broad scale. So data representation was a really important uh, thing for us to be able to take those small images and use techniques like structure for motion, which aligns features between images, to be able to reconstruct very large scale models in order to give our clients bird's eye view of what's happening with the asset. Now, Previously, they were getting these small videos that were lasting for hours. Now they're getting this interactive 3D model, which allows them to observe the asset on a very large scale. So talk about, you know, is, is there any warping happening or is there anything stuck on the propeller? But also be able to click down to the finest scale and talk about the very high resolution image, images that were captured there. So I have lost interactivity of this video on my computer. But the idea here is to give the, uh, give the client a tool to be able to work with the data in more intuitive ways than they were able to do so before. Can they interact with that model from any angle and be able to uh, inspect the quality of uh, information? Um, can they start to take measurements uh, on this information based on image data that was initially captured? You know, start to take 3D measurements on this thing, um, and this is critical for this type of uh, uh, data analytics that they want to do. Previously, the way this was done is uh, divers would go down there with measuring tapes and take this information. And you, they have a set, set of procedures that they need to do, and if the client looks at that data later on and says, hey, we need a new measurement, they can't do that. The next phase was to apply a bit of computer vision to be able to automatically detect certain types of biofouling that are happening on this asset. And this allows you to calculate the coverage of certain types of faults and features that yeah, you might be interested in, and be able to track those things over time. So we can go back to this month by month and see what's happening. <coughs> but the output from the analytics is then a, a report, which is somewhat an analogous to what the divers presented. But then the data gives you the opportunity to go back to it and derive further insights based on what you might observe in the future. So uh, a lot of the things that we sort of ask ourselves with these two things is what do we need to capture and what do we need to analyze? And this is a sort of very close balance of four key components in the sort of commercialization process of these products, which is the end customer uh, as to what they want, which is a very sort of high level definition. I want to make a decision on when this uh, asset will fail or I want to know a full map of all the cracks that are happening here. In-house, we have civil engineers who are more, uh, more of a sort of subject matter experts to the different types of assets to understand that um, what sort of faults should I be looking for in order to provide the client the value that they need. Now, this wasn't a job that a data scientist could take on because they might not have the right expertise as to know what the impact of a fault is. But that's their job, to be able to sift through all the data that we have and be able to present to the different parties uh, are filtered information uh, as to what's happening here. And then finally, all these uh, sort of top-down approach sort of drive 
the uh, the hardware development and the work for the field robotics engineer to who then, who's then responsible to say I need to go out there and capture this sort of data in this sort of format. So these sort of four parties play very closely in order to determine how the information flows. So what I'll initially talk about is a bit about the more the data capture and how that flows into the data analytics. So there's a few things that we need to consider while capturing data in challenging conditions, uh, especially in underwater conditions. Uh, there's, um, first of all, things change underwater. You're limited by power, space, uh, bandwidth. You have limited time for operations. You've got to fit everything in a very small uh, system. Um, and uh, lighting is a big issue. You can't see very far. And you can't position yourself underwater. So what, uh, what precautions does the um, uh, field engineer need to take while collecting this data? And the civil engineer and the data scientist need to understand the physical limitations of capturing data underwater. So for example, uh, the civil engineer or the client might ask the field engineer, I want really sharp images uh, across very large scales. And then it's up to the field robotics to be able to build the hardware which we do internally using machine vision cameras to be able to precisely capture high resolution information with the color, correct, correct color representation underwater and make sure the images are always sharp so you can always come back to that data later on and do whatever post processing that you need to do. Next step is we are working in assets that you can hardly see anything past your sort of hand distance. So what sort of processes can uh, the field engineer take, uh, both in terms of hardware and in terms of sort of data pre-processing, to be able to see through murky waters and be able to highlight key features that would otherwise be missed, as you see on the right there. But in other cases, you, can complete, you can't even see your hand this far away. So what other sensing modalities do we need to capture data to see something like all the O-bikes that are littered across the um, harbor here? And we've seen a few of those. <laughs> Next up is uh, clients have already been engaging different uh, 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 remotely operated systems to capture data. But what they get is thousands of images with no idea where they came from and no idea what they're looking at. So underwater positioning is a big important. Uh, it's really important for us to be able to locate ourselves in a size of a football field size asset, whereas our footprint is only a few meters wide and be able to take scale measurements. So do we need stereo vision? Do we need uh, some other sort of uh, scaling uh, system to be able to uh, make sure our in input data has all the information that you need? And this needs to be considered before you go out into the operation, of course. Finally, a bit of uh, in the pre-processing, you might go out there and collect a lot of data with a very small footprint. What's the best way to uh, communicate that data to the data scientist, to the civil engineer, to the end customer. And uh, in many cases, um, a sort of a bird's eye representation ends up being the ideal approach, especially with these underwater assets, where you can take small snippets of information and be able to show an asset that hasn't been above water for several decades to a client who doesn't know its condition. Now, this was used by the client to uh, plan any um, uh, maintenance procedures, but also used by our internal civil engineer to start to take measurements as to what could be happening wrong where. So all this data comes in with a bit of pre-processing, uh, and depending on the type of um, job that we're doing, the scale of the data changes. But then this feeds into the uh, more towards the machine learning or the data science component of the workflow, which is looking at extracting key information from this. So I'm just going to use this example as an illustration of what's happening there. Um, still sort of infrastructure assessment, but not so much focus on underwater, is looking at uh, the crowns of road tunnels. So this is actually um, a, a road tunnel in Sydney, where they close the tunnel down every six months or so and send people up on cherry pickers with a flashlight to look at what the damage is on the tunnel and then take remediation actions there and then. Any failures in such an asset can be very expensive. They can, things can fall on a car uh, at, the very, uh, at the least worst. Uh, and uh, right now, the inspections are very sparse. And it's not very objective. You know, they, they, they have a night to do it, and they've got to do as much as they can. So they engaged us to be able to systematically capture data, like we talked about previously, uh, sort of high-resolution data, uh, 
with uh, imaging systems that are mounted on a mobile platform that's looking up. And the data analytics, we know we captured thousands and thousands of images, but the data analytics was required here to be able to automatically detect and classify different types of faults that are happening on this asset. This was otherwise not a feasible task for a manual, uh, to be done manually. Next process is similar to the sort of uh, visualization of this data. You're looking at a very small window. So how do you represent, how do you communicate that information to the civil engineer and to the end customer? So here's the sort of uh, bird's eye view of the crown of the tunnel now, where you can zoom into the very smallest parts, highest resolution images, and be able to reason about individual faults. And this is a combination of uh, picking the right data representation and using the right sort of machine learning tools, which I'll go into in a bit. So mainly, like, when did the need for machine learning come for us? Uh, in a lot of cases, we are collecting data sets um, or working with data sets that are spanning hundreds of thousands of images. So you know, primarily focusing on computer vision here. Or in other cases, we have video data that is days and days of continuous data. And the task here, either set by the client or the internal stakeholders, has been, tell me where the important features are. Um, and this has a, has a little documentation of what I mean by important. And the faults can occur at different scales. You might have a millimeter scale problem or a problem that is over the entire asset. And at the same time, you need to produce results uh, very efficiently and accurately within a very short time. And there's obviously high risks uh, for false negatives. Make sure you don't miss anything, because that could lead to a catastrophe. And because we're dealing dominantly with uh, image data for our processing, um, uh, the, use, the use of deep learning is highly embedded in our, in our processes. Um, and especially, like, uh, like uh, that's a lot of the development that we did back in our um, PhDs. Uh, to be able to process different types of input data, which are dominantly uh, images or sonar, to, which can then output uh, different types of information, such as what's in this in image, where is it, uh, how bad is it, or give me some more semantic representation of what's happening. Now, often the sort of insight is considered as a black box, but uh, there are, uh, we need to in, um, incorporate different approaches to be able to um, interpret what's happening inside this black box to get the right results. So why deep learning here? I sort of talked about, you know, uh, it's, it, it has progressed um, very quickly over the last few years, especially for computer vision applications. And it's very good at uh, automatically encoding complex patterns uh, and rather than trying to manually do them. There's been, uh, there's a lot of support uh, in terms of open source code hard, uh, and the access to hardware. Um, to get the state-of-the-art results, and it scales well to large amounts of data. So as a case study of its application, uh, one of the commercial projects that we're working on is uh, analysis of uh, footage captured in underground pipelines. And here, there are already processes out there uh, where contractors are hired to scan hundreds of kilometers of pipelines that lie underneath our cities to capture video information and this video information is then piped to manual annotators who look through this and figure out what's wrong with this asset. So this was a sort of, um, a, a really fell nicely into our sort of data analytics proposal where there's already a lot of manual resources being put in. It already has value. So how do we automate this process? And the idea here is to break that video up into frame level uh, representations to be able to train a system to understand what those individual frames are to be able to infer across the entire uh, video afterwards and collect that information to then produce uh, a sort of a CSV or an Excel file that lists all the faults and even the sort of severity of the different faults. So on the right, you see as we're going past these <coughs> tunnels to be able to detect the different faults and features. So there were, this is one of our biggest sort of um, data analytics project that's still ongoing and um, has a lot of uh, commercial uh, ties. Uh, so there's a lot of key learnings that we derived from this project that actually span to a wide range of deep learning applications. One of the biggest things was during the training is to actually understand the problem. Uh, you know, we have data scientists and civil engineers who are now looking at a 
these under, underground tunnels and not really understanding what is good and what is bad. And that led to putting together a lot of training data in any of the supervised algorithms that was actually quite noisy. You know, someone, someone would say that's a fault, someone would say that's not a fault. So understanding the data was a key component of moving forward there. Next is how much data is needed uh, to be able to get a good enough uh, representation. What if you get your first client who gives you 10, 10 hours of video and you label a certain amount, do you still need 10 hours from the next client? How can you reduce the amount of data that you need because it is very labor expensive? And who, who does the labeling? Uh, we're a small team. Uh, can we get the client to do it? In most cases, no. How do, we use, how do we use external resources to help us? And where and when can we do that? Um, so sort of the next step, where, how can I reduce the training data sort of touched on there? Then, then a lot of people, like, a question that a lot of people ask is, which algorithm or framework should I use? You know, I started off with uh, Tiano, then moved to Cafe, then TensorFlow. And the sort of answer from us is, you know, use whatever you're comfortable with because it, the, the, you, we end up, you end up using a lot of open source things to get the end results. And you, if you're comfortable with tweaking either, either one, stick to that. And often, if a new uh, algorithm comes in that's only supported in um, uh, a certain type of infrastructure, then we might think about switching to that. But we don't uh, end up getting married to one type of uh, approach. And then how complex or deep should the network be? Uh, what if you used a 100-layer network versus a 5-layer network, but the 100-layer network gives you a couple of percent, uh, in percentage improvement in performance? Is that really important? Uh, and we typically err on the shallower networks because it provides for easier inter interpretability as to what's happening. And talking about sort of performance, um, that has also been a key learning stage for us. Like, what are the right metrics uh, when, and when developing a machine learning product? So when you're doing your uh, training, you know, you might be talking about your validation loss or accuracy, but often that doesn't relate quite well to the next steps of the process. For example, here we were actually interested in the end goal with this uh, project was to determine what maintenance actions needs to be taken on individual pipelines. And they needed to know that to a certain dollar of error. Now, that doesn't relate well to individual percentages in the initial ML approach. So is it really worth the time to spend another three weeks to get that accuracy from 92% to 94%? And many of the times, you sort of need to sort of follow that up till the end, till you need to make that step. And then also, how stable or reliable are my results? Uh, have I done some sort of cross-fold validation to make sure I'm not overfitting uh, to the data sets? Um, how well can I uh, guarantee that when the customer sends in a completely new da uh, uh, data uh, set, that I can still guarantee the results will come with this accuracy? The next part for us has been inter interpretability. So often we would get amazing accuracy and then the rest parts of the model are completely failing. So how can you peek into these deep learning models to understand when this says that there's a crack appearing in this image, what is that? Could you somehow be interpreting that from the text underneath? So what sort of uh, um, like, uh, inspection algorithms can you use to figure out which areas of an image in this case are triggering that response? And then this has been important not only to communicate to the client who says, like, why did you choose this? But also probably more important right now for, our, uh, for the people developing these algorithms because things don't work. Like you, the last data set worked perfectly, but the next one doesn't. And you tried the same things and it just like, what, I'm lost as what to try next. And it's sort of uh, not smart to just throw every single algorithm at it and hope for the best. And then finally, uh, sort of thinking about deployment. You know, you've trained these systems uh, and they return an output. Is that the end product? Do we need to do something else after that? What computing resources do I need to really scale this? You know, I've done some pilot studies, I've done some uh, s sample uh, uh, demos, but now the client has given us hundreds of kilometers, like hundreds of hours of data. Are we ready to take that on? And where does the human need to be in the loop? You know, we started off with this grand vision that we're going to build this contained software that will do it all. But we soon realized that uh, if we waited for that dream, then we would be still waiting another three, four years before we get to commercialize anything. Instead, if we propose a hybrid approach, 
where do we use the human and where do where does the algorithm come in so sort of going through this journey of uh, uh, these technologies that we had and trying to commercialize them, we, there was a few key things that we learned. A few of them that I've already touched on, but one of them being interactivity with the client and really understanding what the client requirements were from, and also engaging the client with the different stakeholders, engaging the client with that civil engineer, engaging the client with the data scientist, but engaging the client with the field engineer, for all of them to really understand what their end goal is and that sort of drives uh, each step of the process. And often we find that over delivery has been an issue. So we have this new technology that can give you so much information, like, like in that tunnel. You know, we, we, we were able to extract 500 faults in a small segment of a tunnel, and we gave the client a really nice report and faults that they've never seen before, and they literally said, this is too much for us, and we don't want this information because we can't manage this. And that actually sparked the next phase of that project where we went back to that asset six months later and did the same thing and implemented change detection to just talk about over the six months, only 15 faults had changed and the rest was stable. And that was far more valuable for them rather than just here's an ML thing that can do it all. Now in terms of data itself, uh, field data is unpredictable and challenging. We've got to leave a lot of buffer in all processes while you are dealing with it. Uh, just throwing deep learning at it, like uh, today I'll just, uh, someone released a new, new paper on archive, or there's a new GitHub code, I'm just gonna chuck that in. That, that hasn't really helped us that much. Uh, and at the same time, know the limits of your algorithm, your data, like how uh, diverse is your data, when can I guarantee generalizability, uh, and when can I guarantee some results to the client. And also sort of the limitations of your team, you know, just because the same couple of people were able to learn this thing before doesn't mean, oh yeah, they'll just take two days to do it again. Um, and, in term, and at the end, it's like, you know, we kind of constantly realize that this dream of this magic box that will do it all is not true at all. And ML is not the final product. It is a way to aid uh, our inspection uh, systems to really drive value to the client. And uh, it's something, it, it enables something that would otherwise take a month to do down to a day, but still being done manually. And at the same time, not everything can be or needs to be automated. Uh, with a lot of the ideas that we've had, all right, you know, we're gonna develop this thing that's fully automated, but as I was saying, we would be waiting for years before we can actually commercialize it. So, I guess that brings me to the end, uh, which is where we're heading to next. Um, recently, uh, the company expanded to an overseas market, uh, doing more projects in the US, in the UK, New Zealand. And we're really, uh, from the field robotics side, expanding into the offshore market, uh, where the value from detailed inspection is quite high. And at the same time, we are pushing our data analytics to the next edge and looking at customers such as the pipeline uh, uh, systems who ha already have torrents and torrents of data uh, and they need that analyzed. But the dream of the company is to sort of uh, automate these operations underwater and we feel that perception or understanding the information from the data is a sort of first step to that and it also is a first step to commercialization of that technology. The team is always expanding. There's a lot of uh, things. Uh, the team will be growing quite fast over the next year so look out for us. But more immediately, we are looking for data interns and uh, <coughs> robotics engineers. Thanks. So, Chip, thank you so much. Um, I have hundreds of questions, but maybe someone from the audience want to go first? Earlier on, when you were showing me underwater at propeller inspections, um, I presume you were using structure from motion on the acoustic data, but it looked like you might have been overlaying visual data on the constructed image, or I'm not sure. But uh, the, the question was then when you came to applying DNNs, you were feeding the acoustic and the visual separately. I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on keeping those separate versus trying to reconstruct visual imagery and then, but then feed that into the NNs. The structure for motion was actually pure visual. Uh, no acoustics there. 
in terms of um, the DNNs later on, we ha uh, in terms of products that are already out there, they are looking at them separately, like imaging and acoustics. But in the pipeline, we are looking at how to sort of fuse the two pieces of information together, because especially as we approach an asset, you can see information a lot earlier in the acoustics, and you use that to direct where the most uh, where where you would get the most information gain, where to go next, and then over there you do your high resolution imagery because acoustics has been around for a while. It's de developing still, but it's been around in the underwater space for a while. But what a lot of our clients want is a very high level precision that only imaging can provide. Yeah, just a question about, uh, I guess, uh, the products you have. Yep. Um, you, you talked about uh, dealing with underwater uh, infrastructure as well as agriculture. Do you have any, I guess, plans on going out into rail infrastructure or construction? Yeah, um, uh, just as a thing, uh, agriculture was my PhD, uh, so not anything to do with Abyss Solutions, but... Um, Yes, uh, we are in talks with certain clients about inspection of rail infrastructure, uh, which is very similar to the tunnel inspections that we did. Similar sort of technology, but with a lot of these other jobs that are outside the space of the underwater uh, domain, we prefer not to do too much hardware development because that sort of detracts us from the focus there. And of course, it's very different hardware often. Uh, but in terms of the data analytics, we find that there's a lot of overlap, and that's why we feel comfortable taking those sort of projects on as part of the infrastructure assessment. Hmm. How, about you? Uh, how far away are we in years, perhaps, of crowdsourcing images uh, from our dash cams to upload to infrastructure monitoring um, in a very communal and helpful way? Um, the idea has been floated uh, around quite a bit. Um, right now, uh, the quality of the images from dash cams dealing with sun flare, dealing with um, blurriness of individual frames while moving means that, depending on what sort of task you're doing, right? Uh, let's say you're trying to do pothole detection or you're trying to map the surfaces, um, then just throwing that raw data at it, can, it can be quite noisy data. Um, but there are already people that are looking at that, not us, but there are people already looking at that to uh, get, get the community to pull in information, uh, pull their own data into a data set. But more commercially, there are companies out there that have built specialized imaging hardware that can go out there and collect data for the sake of, inspe for the, for the sake of inspection. Uh, what role do you see the reinforcement learning will play in your line of work? Mm. Um, okay, so some of the things that we're looking at is doing uh, smarter uh, inspections um, underwater. And the idea there is that as we move to a more autonomous inspection platform, how does the robot make the decisions on where's the next best place to go travel to? And it might make some assumptions early on as to, I'm going to go in, uh, gain information in there. But when it gets there, it will get a different representation. So there is potentially chances for reinforcement learning to be able to understand how I should do information sampling in my space. But otherwise, um, in terms of actually like vehicle control, uh, just uh, you can define the model of the vehicle quite nicely already. And you know, there's a lot of people already working on autonomous robots for different purposes, uh, underwater ro robotics. So, not really sure how we'd put it in there, but we're hoping to put it for like inspection uh, purposes. Yeah, great talk. Thanks. Um, I would wonder Same kind of algorithm being used, say, for lesions in someone's colon, for example. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think the main, like, I'm not an expert in the medical field, but one of the things is uh, the risk of false negatives is a lot worse. So with the with some of these more stable assets, you know, the client has even said that if you get this sort of accuracy, it's good enough. So um, it, you might have to have a completely different module in place to medic to manage those risks, and that would require an additional bit of work. But in terms of fundamental. Uh, it's just at the end image processing and not just medical but a whole f bunch of fields that can be applied to and then it might another consideration is how when I was saying understanding the data how easy it is to infer from, from those medical images as a human as to what the problem is and that's a consideration that I would think about yeah any further questions more of um, a generic um, data science question, but um, because the one of the biggest challenges we faced with um, success in understanding the problem itself, how would you go about defining success um, for the project, for both of the clients? Is there, um, is there a process you followed? Or yep. Well, um, yeah, good question. In in many cases, we try to integrate ourselves within the current value chain of the client. So they already have a process in place that requires this sort of output, and we are trying to find a way to do it faster, cheaper, or at a bigger scale. So given that they already have this sort of product in, uh, this sort of need for this uh, end solution, they already know what sort of metrics they want at the end, like what sort of risks they can take uh, to do that. Um, so that we then sort of say, okay, that's the sort of accuracy needs of the client, but the challenge is then how does that accuracy need break down into all the sort of subcomponents of our own internal workflow? And that just sort of changes from situation to situation. So if the pipeline person says, I want to be able to grade this pipeline within 10% accuracy, what does that mean for the deep learning algorithm when trying to look at one frame? Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed. And just now, uh, just now <coughs> you mentioned your company focused on the software part, and deep learning part, but don't focus on the hardware. But when you collect the data and the work data, you also rely on the very good quality the hardware. For example, very good quality camera mm -hmm. and very good quality battery, which can use and the water. Yeah. So how about the hardware part? What kind of hardware do you rely on? And yeah. do you also build the hardware, I mean, purchase the hardware uh, as your own product? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so we do invest a lot of resources in hardware, um, spe especially when we got into the market. We weren't able to get commercially off-the-shelf systems that provided the data quality that we want, uh, but an underwater platform or any sort of uh, robotic platform is comp comprised of a lot of different components, and as many things as we can, we try to buy off-the-shelf. So uh, like underwater vehicle, uh, all the a lot of the positioning systems on that are off-the-shelf, what we didn't find that was satisfactory was the imaging system. And there, that's where we sort of developed that from the ground up uh, to buy off-the-shelf machine vision systems to integrate the right compute resources with them to be able to in integrate them into an enclosure and managing bandwidth and power such that it can go in an underwater um, environment was something that we developed in-house. Now. We developed that as a few mechatronics engineers, uh, and the aim was the end aim of that was to sort of just gather the right quality data. In the process, we were like, okay, can we commercialize this camera? Can we do some? You know, can we actually sell this as a product? And we found like uh, that would the sort of competition in that space was quite high, and with people who are dedicated to making these systems, and that's their sole uh, purpose. What we wanted to do was to be able to use the latest machine vision systems underwater, but if we, um, but other people will use them in the next couple of years. So it's not something that we are hoping to sell, but continuously stick to the state of the art by developing in-house till we find off-the-shelf solutions wherever we can. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you.
Please join me in thanking Switchhead again. Great job. Thanks very much.